Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me on this Friday, April 21st in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. General Hospital made its premiere 60 years ago on April 1st, 1963, with The Young and the Restless following 10 years later on CBS on March 26th, 1973, marking their 50th anniversary. Today, we are going to celebrate these milestones with Michael Fairman, who has covered daytime television for 38 years. Joining Michael is Carolyn Hinsey, who has written for Soap Opera Digest for 31 years and covered General Hospital through the 1990s. And rounding out the group is Stephanie Sloan, who is the Vice President, Editorial Director of Soap Opera Digest, where she will celebrate her 33rd anniversary, I believe, this September. We will honor and look back at some of their favorite storylines, couples, moments, interviews, and so much more from these two legendary shows. Please help me welcome some old friends to the locker room, Stephanie Sloan, Carolyn Hinsey, and Michael Fairman. Hello there, everybody. Hi. That was, those were impressive intros, Alan. <laughs> Very impressive. Wow. Glad we're, we're old. We have a lot to live up to. <laughs> we are all old. We've all been doing this a long time. <laughs> and I really, truly, thank you. I couldn't think of a better way to honor these shows and anniversaries and to have you share, you know, so many memories, opinions with all of us. Before we dive into those two shows, take me back to your first introduction to Soaps. What year, what soaps, what got you hooked? Carolyn, since you've never been here, you go first. Uh, well, hello, Alan. Um, <laughs> it is good to see you. <laughs> oh, thank you, you too. Um, uh, we were not allowed to watch soaps in my house growing up, but my grandparents watched soaps. So I would go to their house after school and watch soaps with my grandparents. So that was the 60s. Uh, As the World Turns was their favorite show. When I went to college, they would write me letters and tell me what was happening to Tom and Margo um, in, when I was in college. And then in my Justin sorority house. D Justin Dees and Margaret? Um, I or Hillary B. And yes, yes. And of course, Lisa. Oh, my God, my grandmother. You will not believe what Lisa's gotten up to now. <laughs> um, she couldn't stay. She had to write me. And then I went to Indiana. And then the girls in that sorority house watched General Hospital. And that was the lead up to Luke and Laura. Um, so I got hooked on that. And then I went to work for the Chicago Tribune. And this is how I know the date. Uh, Luke and Laura's wedding was my first day of work as a reporter at the Chicago Tribune. And I cut out to go watch the wedding on my first day of work with all the secretaries in the cafeteria. So That, that, is, that is so funny because I, I got a message earlier uh, up here. Susan, I think I'm trying to find it quickly. Uh, Susan said, I might lose my job for tuning in this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so exactly. Um, you weren't covering soaps, were you at the Chicago paper? No, 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 no. I was, it was boring. Not till I got to the Daily <laughs> News. Um, and I started in like 89-ish covering, in fact, the first story I wrote was about Gloria Monte getting fired. Um, and I think she fired for Nola Hughes. Anyway, I wrote this big story and it was a big scoop and the bosses were like, who's going to care? I'm like, trust me, they're going to care. This is, of course, before the internet. You have to buy the paper yeah. the next day. Um, and then that's how I got to know Scott Barton, who was the publicist on GH, because he didn't want me. He was begging me not to write it. And then when I went to Digest in 92, Lynn said, what soap do you know the best? And I go, well, General Hospital. And I happen to already know the publicist. So she said, OK, you'll cover General Hospital. So I covered it all through the 90s. You know, Lois and Brenda, Stone and Robin. I was at Ned and Lois's wedding in Brooklyn. Um, I mean, I mean, look who won out there. Uh, Finola used for sure. Well, <laughs> fire um, back that. Fire back then. <laughs> with all due respect, Carolyn, I had GH in like ninety six, ninety seven, because I did Ingo's first interview, and it was like some Sunny and Brenda also for me. So. Just going to okay. clarify that. Yeah, <laughs> even though I'm so much older than you, Stephanie, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see we share something. We do. <laughs> we share a lot. And Steph, for you? Um, let's see. I think I might have said this last time I was you, here, but maybe did. people don't remember. But my first literal memory is of standing in my crib and the woman who was taking care of me was watching Edge of Night. So I had like a black and white screen with like the Edge of Night logo on it. And then my mom, I think before she went back to work, kind of occasionally watched Another World because I had very vivid memories of seeing that. But 
it really was Luca Mora that sucked me in. My famous story of planning their wedding around my orthodontist appointment um, is legendary in my yeah, life. For my... That's so cute. Isn't that sweet? But it happened to be like two blocks away from my school and I made a deal with them. I clearly knew when it was going to be. And I said, I will come, but I get to stay for the whole hour because they had little TVs in the tray tables. So I got to watch the whole thing, but they ultimately moved me into a bigger like exam room so I could see it on a proper television. And um, my parents would send me soap opera digest in camp. So, but I too got in trouble for watching soaps a lot. Yeah. And it became my parents' favorite story to tell that I then got a job here at the magazine. Wow. You know, it's funny you say that about like planning something around uh, the events, you know, Luke and Laura's wedding. I mean, I was watching soaps back then. I don't know that I ever planned, but I must have been running home because Guiding Light was still on at three o'clock. So I must have been running home to catch because, you know, before the VCR time. Um, Michael, for you? Well, I think I also shared this once before, but mine was I, my mom was watching a lot of soap operas. She, what we watched, she watched, you know, all my children, one life general hospital, but she also watched as the world turns and why not like a lot, another world. And I, got sick. I was an asthmatic and I had really bad health problems and I had to stay home from school and I couldn't go to school. So I would sit and watch the shows with her. And by osmosis, I started knowing all the characters and the storylines and the actors' names. And by like nine years old, I was putting on little award shows for my family where I would literally do makeup categories for the soap opera thing. It was like, and later I ended up working on the Emmys, right, and all, and the Soap Opera Digest Awards and all these things. But I would do a fake award show, cutting pictures of all the different actors and coming up with categories like best heroine and best bad guy or whatever. So I kind of got all in it at that point. And funny story about, so Luke and Laura's wedding, I remember I was working in New York at actually at MCA Records at the time. And I'm like, shit, you know, crap, this, the wedding's on, I, I can't see it. So I ran into a something like a Sears and was watching it on like 80,000 monitors and just standing there with a bunch of people who are all around the TV set glued. glued to this big thing. So that's kind of how I got sucked in. And then later, I never realized that the information I had in my head would come in useful <laughs> career I know. until much later, later, you know, cause I, I started working in daytime producing on the Emmys and the Soap Opera Digest Awards and all these things for Dick Clark. And then yeah. went to right. Soap City, which is where I started being, doing a journalistic part of my career. So that's kind of the short answer. I, I love that all of our history with soaps is prior to the VCR, mm -hmm. you know, and yes. you know, uh, whatever they are yeah. today, whatever they're called. Um, Although like when I moved to Chicago and started my job, they had invented VCRs and I had one in my apartment, but they didn't have remotes. And I was a cheerleader in high school. So I took my baton from cheerleading and I would lie on the couch and I would use my baton to fast forward <laughs> on the VCR so I didn't have to get up. <laughs> That's clever. very clever. Kiki. That's Thank very you. clever. But I was going to say, like, you're all talking about like your family's watching, like they all watch so much without the VCR. Like they, mm -hmm. it was appointment television. It's just oh. so impressive to think when it was three networks, what it, what it was like for people to tune in and view. Yeah, um, right. What, since you all were really introduced to GH early, what about Young and the Restless having, you know, now working in the industry and having to cover it. What do you remember about your introduction to that show? Um, I was a huge fan of cricket. So when I was ah. in high school, it was the mid eighties and she was in high school. So I got completely sucked in by her because she was my age and I really I remember related. Who played, who played cricket? Laura Lee. Yeah. It was Laura Lee Bell. Oh, cricket. We're right. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Cause I, I think you're thinking, uh, Guiding Light or As World Turns, right? That wasn't there like another cricket in history yeah. or something? Yeah, right. Yes. Cricket, cricket Montgomery. Montgomery. Yes. 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 Cricket Montgomery. That, you, yeah, you threw me. Where my grandmother is looking down know. from heaven and she's so proud that I knew she that. She is indeed. <laughs> but I, my, it's kind my of. My mother and grandmother too. <laughs> it's sort my of my grandmother same. behind me in that picture. That's her. I she's love watching her. us. 
But it's my same thing with World Turns. Like, I started watching that because of Lily. Like, again, my age, loved Lily and Dusty, loved Lily and Holden, and I loved Cricket and Danny. So that set me on my path with Young the Restless, and I've been watching since. And I like the <laughs> older characters. I was Catherine Chancellor all the way. Mm -hmm. Cricket did and nothing I, for me. I was like, give me the Duchess. And I, I'm coming with you. would you say that was for you, Carolyn? That you again? Were, what year would you say? Like, uh, well, you I would, if I uh, was at my grandparents, uh, I was able to watch the whole CBS lineup before right. As the World Burns. So then we'd watch Young and Restless and I want to say Capital. Yeah. Um, then Capital. As the World Turns. And then I would try to keep it on for Guiding Light and my grandmother would be like, that's enough soap operas. Like, <laughs> why don't you open your homework? <laughs> well, I love the beginning of YNR, like the very, very beginning in those first eight years before. Because I remember being like, what is this? And I remember it was, you know, 73 and it was like, what is this? And I remember Snapper and all the weird names. Me too. I remember Snapper. Snapper. And I remember, I was like, oh, wait, they're singing on the show. <laughs> they're singing on the show. And and everyone was beautiful. Not that they're not on other shows, but it was like everybody was beautiful. And I loved the I loved Jeannie Cooper and the Duchess and Brenda Dixon was Jill. And they were like going at it. And, and the Philip Chancellor story with Donnelly Rhodes and all of that. And I remember how great the, the music was and everybody sang. And I thought, this is really cool. And then I remember that switch, which we now know from Jamie Lynn Bauer saying she got fired and then they fired the whole, the whole family was gone. Um, I remember all of a sudden there were the Abbots and the, the Abbots and Numistic over the show. And I'm like, what happened to the other people I really liked? And they weren't there anymore. But I really watch it from very early on. Wow. That's incredible. I'm hearing the bracelet Melody gave me for her 30th anniversary or 25th, she gave, imagine that, she gave all the press journalists beautiful charm bracelets. So wow. it's- Well, yes. not all, I, I didn't get <laughs> That's impressive, well, that's impressive. We're, it's I'm, 25 years, MTS, 25 years. <laughs> what? So, I love that. Stephanie, you want to borrow it sometime, I'll loan it to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'll figure it out at a time this weekend. We'll hook up. You know, I think I mentioned it to Stephanie and Michael. I was so incredibly impressed at how uh, Young and the Restless honored 50 years with, an, you know, a party we would have seen in the 1980s for our shows. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, right, absolutely. You know, all of you, how do, you know, not just those parties, but how do you think, um, you know, talk about your thoughts on how they honored these two huge milestones. I Go so ahead, Mike. YNR, well, YNR I think went all out, and I also think they had the budget to go more all out. And, and, and I'm talking on air as well, Michael. So in oh in, okay, so yeah, go go with the whole the whole yeah, yeah. Uh, bang. Yeah, I think that wine. I mean. Tell me what you guys think of this. You know, I know 50 is the golden anniversary, right? So is 50 seem bigger to you than 60? Because I think 60 is also an incredible accomplishment to even be on the air for 60 years and the juggernaut the General Hospital is. But I felt like kind of the way it was playing out was just that YNR just had a lot more things in the works and, and plan in terms of um, out there, in terms of like media and things they were doing. Um, on the air, they did some returns. You know, you had Barbara Crampton on, you had um, others on, um, which was nice. I, I think it's very, very hard to honor a show, like come up with a great, I've always thought these shows when they try to do something for the anniversaries, do you like the shows that they do for the anniversaries? Because it seems hard to, what are we going to do for it? You know, I remember talking to Frank Valentini, like, and the writers at um, the TCA, how are you guys going to honor this show? And that was when the nurse's ball came up. They thought that would be the right way to do it, combined with Sonia Eddy's passing and kind of wrap that all in. So everybody had their own way of doing it. Um, and I do say to that party, the party was great. I mean, there was, it was really spectacular. And I remember all the actors and people coming up to me, and I don't know what they said to you, Stephanie, but they were like, I'm shocked. I'm so surprised. It's such a big thing. They never do this anymore for us. Yeah, you never see that anymore to what all of us are used to when we go party hopping at all these things at the Emmys or all these special events because the dollars just aren't there. So I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah, you did. You did. Okay. Steph? Um, well, 
on air, I will say certainly maybe to Michael's point, like 50 is just sort of a spectacular number that I think is a much bigger splash than 60, even though 60 is just mind boggling when you actually think about it. But for the 50th, I just felt like, you know, kind of like Days did, it's sort of let's celebrate a bicentennial. Like they kind of came up with the same exact idea, but they executed it in a different you know, way. But I really like that. I loved the tribute of the jazz lounge tribute to Neil. I felt that they like mm, checked a yeah. lot of boxes on air with YNR. Like, I mean, I got just the look between Crystal Khalil and Brighton James, like gave me chills, like when they did that. And so I thought that I thought it was great who they brought back. Like who didn't love Mamie walking into the <laughs> Abbott mansion? Like that <laughs> killed me. Yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah. even I having more of that. I wanted more Mamie, yeah. more Jill. I did too. But I think, see, I think that us even saying that is exactly why sometimes they don't bring people back because it's like, it's just never enough. And almost like it whets your appetite that you want more. But and so- Isn't that interesting I though? Carolyn, I we we are- fans of the show we right. want more yes you know, no we do we will we do. tune in for those people <laughs> right. i will and i will say this just in a general thing i always argue that the people watching now are are majority longtime viewers so all of the people that we kind of grew up watching are the people that we still want to see it's familiar it's a sense of home i totally am on board with introducing new characters but at the bread and the butter at the end of the day is um you know kind of a lapsed viewer who you can get back by bringing back people that they know and right. i feel like YNR very much accomplished a lot of that just by showing liana and like working her in the way they worked bringing gina just so that you know solidified danny being back and mm -hmm. daniel mm -hmm. so i i do think that YNR did like a lot of things that made it feel extremely celebratory and then right. yes to your point the, the actual real life party that they had was spectacular and huge <laughs> and um just felt like as celebratory as it did on camera right. and then as for gh i think they sort of went with what they know like the nurses ball is always successful it happens this time of the year it worked out perfectly and then i feel building into that with the tribute to sonia and epiphany was just beautiful like those episodes were the sonia epiphany script the yeah. script was beautiful if you just listen to the work like mm -hmm. how it was do you well, know who wrote it i don't know yes. elizabeth courts recording right Mm -hmm. but, but I really thought it was exceptionally from a written perspective. They really, to your point, touching all the boxes, they did that with Sonia and Epiphany. Yeah. In, in just how they said it. Mm -hmm. um, and anytime those episodes, the same with Neil, with Christoph St. John's Memorial, you know that the actors are, it's so, it, there's a mush between real life and, a, sure. and, and the characters. So that was great. Right. Susan Eisenberg just said, right on, Stephanie, as you and Carolyn always say, play your history. Play your history. <laughs> Thanks, true. Susan. You're right. Yes, thank you, Susan. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It, it is really true. It, it, you know, well, let's look back at the oh years. You know, I, oh, I yes, like sorry, it. Carolyn. Yeah, my apologies. Okay. I'm going to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> I like how GH has parceled out the anniversary. Like the party on Winer was good. But I, I mean, like I would have said, I would have taken a week of Mamie reminiscing that dining room. You know, she had a minute with Jill and, you know, they used a flashback to prop up Diane, which I wrote in my opinion column, like, I'm not interested in that. I want her to sit Jack down and go, Jackie, what are you doing? What would your father say? Mm -hmm. You know, we needed all that. But whereas GH, it's like, and I understand the logistics and we all talk to Frank, but like, when can we get Jane Elliott? When can we get Emma Sams? How do we work in these people that are coming back for short term. It's not like they could get them all in one week, you know, and blast like the like YNR did. They had to time it to when, when's Emma Sam's coming over from London? How's she feeling with her long COVID? You know, maybe they pre-tape and post-tape around her health. Like, but they're working so hard to parcel out like a month of the anniversary. And I really like that because you never know, like there's Ethan the other day popping up you know, oh, there's her son. Oh, okay. And you know, Victor's not going to win, but it's fun to watch all these oldies, but goodies come back to bring him down. It, it, it's a total callback to 40 years ago with the Ice Princess. When, Jean, that, when Laura said the other day, the Ice Princess was my wedding gift. It was like, oh my God, even I forgot that. Right. And on the, on the Ice Princess, I just want to say, and to your point, I love that they're hearkening back to it for the anniversary in this anniversary month, which I think is pretty brilliant. And I was thinking of these past storylines and, and laughing so hard. When you look back at the Ice Princess, you guys, 
and watch like Jeannie Francis holding the gun in her gown and, and all of those people. It is so campy, brilliant now, like looking at it now, yeah. like 40 years later, because I remember doing the clip package for the Emmys for GH 55th and I had to like call through stuff. And when I came upon those ice princess scenes with everybody dressed in the gowns and the thing for dinner and it was the cast, and it was so funny. It look, it's so campy now. I don't think I liked it back then and now I do, you know? Well, the one thing I do want to say is like kind of Carolyn's point. I feel like that's what's so great about the different, like between the two shows. It's like we were celebrating two huge moments on two shows within like two weeks of each other. And they gave us very different vibes. And I think that's what's so great about it, that you don't really have to do a like-like comparison. Like GH's party was this, but Y&R's party was that. Like they approached it different ways. And I think that's why they were both successful. And mainstream I agree. press I agree, covered Stephanie. these anniversaries. Yes. But I will say mainstream press, I feel, covers it because they see the value of soap fans. I mean, if anything, you know, I think oh, the, probably the three of us on this um, Zoom, uh, because Alan, you did work on the other side of it at first, but I get it for, for a publicist getting a mainstream yeah. hit is like check check it's great to the upper you know the upper level management and yet at the same time they should i understand that if you can get people magazine or entertainment weekly or whatever to do something about soaps great but what they're seeing is the reason they keep doing these stories is because i imagine the response is so incredible that they maybe weren't expecting that it kind of opens the door for that kind of you know publicity like access hollywood doing you know dick van dyke mm -hmm. how many days of our lives like so fans are online and I feel that uh, we always knew that and mainstream is just kind of getting that sense in the past few well, years. Well, I also think at the time I was still doing it, there were too many shows. Right. So they didn't, you know, they didn't always cover it anymore, you know? Nor now was the internet what it was when you were there. Correct. Right. There, was, there was none when, you know, right. when I was, right. you know, it had just begun. I just wanted to read, Jean said, as much as we love the actors and characters, we also love all of you that cover soaps. Oh, um, thank you, Jean. And, and Marnie said, General Hospital's episode honoring Sonia Eddy and Epiphany's passing was so beautiful, I ugly cried during the episode. Oh, uh, right? I, the yeah, of course. Cries. Sonia deserved that. We did. I was going to say back to your point too, Stephanie. What always, what I love when when they do get mainstream hits, you always look whenever you see the most popular of the day and who's got the comments. It's all the soap opera stories, right. whatever items it is, who's ever coming and going, whatever anniversary. Those are in the top few of every one of these mainstream sites, which proves the power of this. Absolutely, with the audience. I mean. This is this genre and this audience is just so dedicated that and they're looking for any kind of news, you know, anything. Right. All right. How many other shows are celebrating 50 and 60 year milestones? Not, not that many. And this is all because of the audience and That's just right. the nature, obviously, of this kind of storytelling and what it does, I feel, for a viewer. Yeah. Well, it's familiar. It's comforting. I can't go to my grandmother's anymore, but I can watch soaps. Right. They're, they're, so they are. I'm going to try because there's a lot to get to. So I'm going to try and do this quick. Let's start with you, Steph. I'm, you know, just quickly, General Hospital, some of your favorite storylines over the years. Uh, oh my gosh. Are you kidding? Yeah. Well, first of all, yeah, anything Luke and Laura. I mean, Beecher's Corners, like Wyndham's department store, loved it all, was like, could not have been more in. But I will tell you then, like, skip. I, Sonny and Brenda, like I could watch them all day, every day. I was the biggest Sonny and Brenda fan. I loved Frisco and Felicia. I mean, let me tell you all I need. The whole album will still pop up on my iPod, like, or my like iPhone, like music library. So the, I was much more drawn to the romances. Your, like your I iPod, didn't. Your Victrola? Yes. Yes. As I was like <laughs> cranking it to try to drop the knee and listen to the record. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm a sucker for romance. You're not going to hear like BJ's heart from me, like and Stone's AIDS. I thought those, that was not my sweet spot. I appreciated those stories. But they're definitely not my favorites. Okay. Michael. Well, I was BJ's heart transplant storyline. I was all about that. And Stone and Robin, the AIDS storyline. Brenda and Sonny, there was nothing better, though, than leaving her in the rain and the scene when she's in her wedding dress with Jason waiting for him. And that was great. Um, Jason's brain injury, which ended up being paramount to the story moving forward, that they changed his whole personality. 
Um, Luke and Laura Mary and Scotty Returns I had as, as another great one. But I really love General Hospital doing the emotional, heart-pulling, heart-tugging stories and the social issues that they told. Mike's Alzheimer's, I will still put in there as well on the new side. Um, all those romances and super couples were, you know, part of the day. But when you look at the storytelling that really, to me, stands the test of time, it's these stories like The Heart Transplant, Stone and Robin. I can still watch the final scene of Stone dying and looking at, Ro you know, Robin, I can see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. And the heart transplant storyline, you know, when they hugged in the hallway, Felicia and Bobby, and they realize whose heart is going into who. Not uh, Barbara Jean. Not Barbara Jean. Not Barbara Jean's <laughs> heart. You know, all of those. I've got my patrol in my head. Patrol. Uh, <laughs> all of those are just spectacular. Spectacular. And GH did it better than anybody else in those particular stories. And to Stephanie's point, yes, the romance was amazing because we rooted once they could establish these couples like Felicia and Frisco and you know uh I even like Patrick and Robin I really loved together um you were rooting for these people you were rooting for these people and you saw the ups and downs of the relationship and they played them out beautifully so I think General Hospital is just an absolutely exceptional show historically um and one of the reasons it lasted 60 years yeah I would agree, that. Luke and Laura, obviously. I remember the brownstone, you know, Bobby. Oh, I love the brownstone. the brownstone. That was a really fun, like, who's going to run into each other today? Um, I, uh, Stephanie and I have had this debate many times. Um, I believe that GH did a really good job of balancing those two things. You know, BJ's heart transplant and Stone's AIDS with Sonny and Brenda, Ned and Lois. You know, you've got Stone dying and you've got Lois jumping out of a cake. That's what made it so great to me and made it so much fun to cover. Cause it was like, you know, Hey Scott, what's the big story this week for digest? And he's like, here's five. And you know, which one is going to work to sell a cover, which one, you know, is, you know, which actors available for an interview. Um, I do remember interviewing Claire Labine before Vanessa started airing. And she said, wait till you see this girl, like wait until you see her chemistry. And then she told the story of their hands touching on the suitcase. And I'm like, oh, their hands touched. Okay. <laughs> and, oh, like, I'm not writing that. And then, God, there, I mean, I don't want to swear. There it was. Like, their hands touched on the suitcase and their eyes met. And you're like, holy cow, that, this is electric. Mm -hmm. And then, like, remember him ripping the microphone off her and her screaming and crying? That was a Sure do. Moment. That was a big moment. That was a big one. Yeah. Um, but also just like going on location, like Ned and Lois's wedding was a week in Brooklyn and it was so on the fly. It was like Shelly Curtis and Wendy Rich and Claire and Claire lived in, on the block they were filming. So they're like, oh, we need B-roll. Let's have them run down the block. And Claire's like, well, my house is right there. So like everyone goes to her house and has like, you know, coffee and whatever. And then they're like, OK, now, Lois, run in your wedding dress down my street. And it was just so much fun to like be there for the behind the scenes of it and see like the dialogue was obviously already written, but so much of it was improvised and, and kind of done on the fly. And it was really, it was, I thought it was historical just to be able to watch it. And by then soaps weren't going on location so much anymore. It wasn't like days in new Orleans and now they weren't doing that lot. so much. And it was just really lot. fun and different. Yeah, now we use the parking lot. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We, we yeah. use PPAC. <laughs> I was going to say, or PPAC. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm having flashbacks of toilet paper rolling down the street, Alan. Don't make me. Bounty. <laughs> Fucking lot or bust. That's fine. Um, Carolyn, g stories on Young and the Restless. Well, anything with, like I said, with Catherine Chancellor. Um, I liked the Jill recast, obviously, but it wasn't the same. She wasn't as crazy as as Brenda Dixon. You know, I didn't I didn't have the same feeling for her. I was really sad when they killed John Abbott. I felt like that was a big mistake. Um, I didn't understand it. And, uh, you know, uh, but I guess we're talking about things we liked. Um, anything, no, Phyllis? That's, uh, you know, that's that's interesting. I mean, Maybe. that's, you know, killing legacy characters is a big deal. You know, Alan Maureen Bauer. Alan Quartermain. <laughs> yeah, Maureen Bauer, right. You know. Yeah, Maureen Bauer. Uh, you but, know, there, there uh, are consequences. I mean, it is great story sometimes, but you know, a John Abbott seems 
you know. To not have him floating out there just was a, a, a big, huge loss. But speaking of Phyllis, the octopus in the bed was a pivotal moment because it was so crazy. Yeah. And speaking of locations, there's Paul and Chris in Nevis. And, you know, they're doing all this location stuff. And then, of course, Sheila and Lauren. And then when, Stephanie, do you remember, we had to sign NDAs when they <laughs> when they made Sheila alive and crossed her over to Bold and Beautiful. Yeah. We and we were we had the cover and I think we were bi-weekly then. We all had to sign non-disclosure agreements like under penalty of wow, you know, that is the first time I've heard that in that. daytime. That's interesting. That we all had That's to sign this thing that. that we would not tell us. Oh yeah. I feel like we had to sign them just to even get the um scripts back in the day. Like oh, we, yeah, for sure. there was it was yeah. like I mean it would still be today, but it's like you are going to get fired if you repeat what is happening. <laughs> like yeah, there right. was some uh, that serious, was like, like, like we would always try to assure everybody, like, it's not getting out. <laughs> like, we're yeah. all going to get fired if it does. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to tell my friend at a bar what's yeah. going to happen to Luke when it's going to cost me my job. So right. don't you worry about that. Uh, but that was a huge, when she turned up alive on B&B &B was just so crazy. I know we're not talking about BB, although I am drinking out of my bowl of water. <laughs> Very that. on brand. Very Thank on brand. Michael, oh. you're young and the restless. Oh, uh, well, we got to, of course, Cassie's death was probably one of the most iconic all time storylines. This so resonates today. And I, I told this story, I think, before I had, I was recovering from surgery and I was in Florida at my grandparents with my mom and dad. My dad, who's, you know, never cries at anything. And we're literally watching the, the last, <laughs> this is the one where she dies. And the music is playing and not, you know, the music playing and Sharon and Nick and the whole thing. And she flatlines and my dad, who was just bawling, it just moved so many people. You don't have to know exactly the whole thing. You could literally tune in and be sucked in by the understanding of the storyline of a little girl dying and her parents, you know, trying to deal with it. Um, and that, today has really had legs. If you watch it now, I can watch a clip of it and just start crying. Really, it just sucks me in. Um, yeah. Don't I, you miss Cassie's Corner at <laughs> Yes, Cassie's Corner. They forgot her. Anyway, go on. <laughs> See, you would point that out and that is very true. That's true. Um, I also, I love the Lori Leslie beginning the Brooks sisters battling each other and Lori trying to ruin Leslie's relationships with any man. And she wrote the book in my sister's shadow to try to like destroy her. Um, Victoria Rowell coming to the show as Drusilla was a monumental moment for the show, working in the foster care storyline that she, you know, was so about. And then Devon coming into the show. Um, I loved Jill K. Phillip, like I said earlier. Um, Jeannie Cooper, Brenda Dixon, and Donnelly Rhodes. I thought that story was amazing. Um, and and Jeannie Cooper playing um, Catholic Marge. alcoholism. The Marge? Oh, oh, oh. the alcoholism. <laughs> the Marge. Oh. Marge, too. Marge. Um, but I like the alcoholism story because, you know, that touches upon also what Jeannie was dealing with in real life, too. Um, and Sheila putting her mother's head in the oven. Do you remember that? <laughs> She put her mother's head in the oven. Um, and Sheila Lauren was just an amazing storyline, nasty nurse Sheila. And how Kimberlyn Brown has lasted all of these decades. And we still watch her and love her on B&B. &B, but she's on today. She's, you know, what a testament to that character that was created and to Kimberlyn to go over two shows. Yep. Agreed. Steph, you're a YNR. Well, I was going to say, I could co-sign everything here. It's like, despite what I said about BJ, yeah, Cassie, Cassie's death is one of my favorites on this show. Um, I'm not a big, like, crier, so with these kinds of things, so I can't really, like, share that experience. Oh, my God, that was what I loved. I really did. You yeah, know, I'm, I, Carolyn you will, know, Carolyn will love, absolutely vouch for that. People. Reba would make me cry. I will future. text her watching something like, oh my God, are you dying? And she's like, no, not really. Yeah, like, I, I, I can I appreciate it, music but I don't, you know. it, it doesn't, it just doesn't affect me in that way. However, yeah. I can very much appreciate it. But I will say just the entire story of um, Malcolm Drew and Neil and how they played that out over so many years before we found out or before it was revealed that Malcolm was Lily's father. Like, right. I just thought the way that that 
was crafted was just so genius. And so in addition to everything else everyone has said, I would have to add that into the mix that that was just, and I, and as a kid, I will tell you when I started watching, I loved the Williams family. Like Mary was like so strict. Mary, and, and, Mary Williams. Like I just would like stop and pay attention if they were in like the the kitchen of the Williams house. Carolyn Conwell doing yes. that. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I don't think I've shared this on the show. I have a great Doug Williams story. My sister was in California on vacation and my, at the time watched Young and the Restless and she was driving next to him like on Rodeo Drive or something and literally went in reverse on Rodeo Drive because she was like, oh my God, I think it's Paul Williams. <laughs> That's hilarious. Wait, I will tell a crazy LA driving story too. I, and this is recent in the last 10 years. I pulled off at Lancashire off of, um, I, I guess, I the 101. And literally the person who pulls up next to me turns to me and says, do you know how to get so-and-so? And like, I have zero sense of direction. Even if I drove in LA for a thousand years, I wouldn't. But I looked at her and I'm like, oh my God, you're Brenda Dixon. I'm like, I work in soap opera digest. <laughs> oh my <laughs> was God. like, you were the only two people next to each other. I'm like, I cannot help you. I'm like, but you want to do catching a up? <laughs> that is hysterical. Brilliant. Meanwhile, Stephanie's like, so what have you been doing? <laughs> yeah, right. What are you up to? Quick, red light. light. Catching up with Brenda Hold Dixon and red light. Um, fans are asking, what, if, if you're able, I don't know anything about this, Doug Davidson. We didn't see him for the anniversary. You know, people were... We did not. And I will say the show is really, these are, it's sort of just like an unspoken sort of situation. We really don't ask about it because I feel if, if, if there was something to tell, they would tell us. However, he did participate in our 50th anniversary special. There is a lovely two page interview with him. He was very positive about the show. And yeah. um, so he is still he was great. I love connected Paul Williams. To the rest Paul Williams yeah. is a great character. Love Couldn't him. agree more. He's yeah. very missed. Could not agree more. Yeah, yeah. Lo loved him. Um, a, a, not as an insult to any of the teams over the years, but you know, let, your favorite head writing teams at these shows, like that you think maybe really wow. serviced the shows the Boy. best. Well, Claire Labine, to me, Claire at General, at General Hospital, um, so that was really the high point. Um, of I would say her, I mean, Ryan's hope obviously was a high point, but uh, just the way she, like I said before, the way she balanced everything, the way you had Stone dying and Lois jumping out of a cake. I mean, that whole like Eddie Main story was so crazy, but it's like, oh, Wally can sing and Wally's in a band. What can we do with that? Um, you know, so when, when they, when Kurt and Taylor would perform in New York and I was, you know, friendly with them, um, he would sometimes, they would stay at my apartment sometimes. And 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 uh, my my doorman got Stephanie. You remember this? It was Eighty Sixth Street. My doorman's like, Justin Kiriakis is in your apartment, <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> he goes, Justin, Kier and I was. I had to think for a minute. I'm like, oh, you mean Ned Quarterman? Ned Ashton? Then Ned Quarterman's in my apartment. All right, who was Justin Kiriakis? It was that, like my doorman couldn't get over that. You know, he was staying with me. And, uh, I, but back to the point, the way that Claire took people's strengths and, and monetized that, you know, like Maurice liked to mumble. So they made Sonny like a mobster and he's really quiet. You got to lean in everything Sonny says, you got to lean in. What's he saying? What's he doing? You know, it's made it more interesting. And it, it just, it monetized the strengths of the actor. And that's what she did with Wally and Eddie Main. And, and then, you know, Reen and Wally have talked about it. Like their real chemistry, like Kelly and Mark on All My Children, you're going to capitalize on that when those two people are falling in love. Why not? Um, so I think she did an amazing job with all that. And I think she was the high point of, there've been many, many good regimes and I really yeah, like, of course there are. But and, me, and everybody's got their strengths and weaknesses, but right. your personal faves, it, it's really not an insult to anybody. Okay, good. Cause I would never want to insult anybody. You know, it's funny. <laughs> I don't even know that I could speak to like having a general hospital favor. Whoever was writing in the eighties would be whoever I would say. Cause yeah. that's really, to me was Suck my very Suck special part. And it was before I worked at the magazine. It's sometimes hard when you work at the magazine to kind of put that stuff into context. And I feel it's like if anyone on this, uh, discussion can argue Bill Bell like wasn't the, the best wine writer. Like, I mean, yeah, 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 very true. He, he created it all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I would say William J. Bell for Young and the Restless. Yeah, yeah, and I was well, gonna, sign. I was going to triple sign because what I was going to say is it's always interesting, right? With Y and R, they always go back to 
if even the writer, if, if actors were complaining, if people were unhappy, it's always like, well, Bill Bell wouldn't have done this. It wasn't like Bill Bell. And and the truth is that's correct. Bill Bell's mm -hmm. writing and the way he laid out story and how it unraveled over long periods of time and his brilliance is what was made that show. But that, also you can't even give short shrift to, sorry, Michael, but like what he did at Days but, before he came to YNR. Oh, I mean, it, it's like the just even putting Doug and Julie together, or I, I guess that was actually uh, Elizabeth Harrow who did that. But, you know, just prior to that, like mining all of that amazing of that. you know drama to then create his own show and be so successful. It's, it's, I just, besides like, I can't speak to like, you know, Agnes Dixon, Erna Phillips, like as part of the same conversation. I mean, you can speak to the them as part conversation. of the same conversation. Right. They are. Yeah, Doug, Doug Marlin didn't their create brain child. Like it's a little different, you know. Like yeah. This is their this is right. their yeah. baby. It's their baby. Yeah, this was their baby. And in terms of the GH writers, to Stephanie's point, I and I also think, as everybody knows, it is such an awful job. Like it's a great job and an awful job to be a head writer and a writer on the show because you never can make anybody happy. You're always going to get complaints. There's always these problems, and everybody's had good and bad. Like the regimes, there's been some that have stunk. But a lot of them do a lot of good until they burn out. Yeah. You feel it's burnout. I do think Claire Levine serviced the show incredibly well with the social issue storylines and the romance and everything you were saying, Carolyn. I do agree with that. But others have had great moments along the way, too, until they got burned out. Mm -hmm. The thing about Bill Bell, to, to, Steph, to both of your points, he knew where he was going with the story. Like right. he knew if, if an actor went to him, like all the actors want a story about them. It's like, oh, I got a story. Right. And, they go, and they go into the head writer and they go, I've got a great story for me. And, you know, it's the head writer's job to look at 30, 40, 50, in GH's case, 50 people and say, it's not about what's best for you. It's about what's best for the show. And he could say to an actor, look, you may not know like what's going on now, but in four months, here's what's going to go on. And you don't always get the sense now with some, you know, right, shows in the last few years that they knew where they're going. You know, so that Doug was Marlin. another Bill Bell. Do the shows know where they're going? Anymore? I mean, because I think <laughs> now you don't have what, you know, I think there was a way of the times back then with how story was constructed and, and everything. And, and now it always feels a lot of times like, where is this all going? Are right. you changing it? Well, like Agnes's Bible that you created yeah. all my children with. Douglas Marlin had the Doug Cummings completely written out in a Bible that John Wesley Ship read, you know, from beginning, you know, he knew, you know, like those things I don't think happen in right that length of just, you know, time and description because of time and money probably in yeah. a lot of ways. Right. And networks are so much stricter with money now. Like if an actor has a two show a week guarantee yeah. and that's a hundred episodes in a year, the networks come down on you if you run them too much more because you're, you know, let's say you, owe, I, mean, I don't want to give numbers, but you know, it, yeah. you, if you use them 150 times, you've used them 50 more times than you needed to based on his contract. And meanwhile, that guy over there wasn't using, you still got to pay him. If you have, right. I remember one actor on One Life to Live once got $90,000 at the end of the year because they hadn't used him. He just got a check. Because well, I think that's also kind of something we don't really talk about is how actors are paid. So, right, you know. Right. Well, and let's all talk about it as the fans that we all were. Like, I'd be, you know, I, I've said it before. The one time I called CBS when I was a fan of World Turns was when Scott DeFreitas was fired. How can you fire a used child? Right. You know, like it just had no comprehension in my brain as a teenager or 20 year old or whatever I was. You know, and that's all of us as fans. We don't know the money side, you know, and I right. learned it quickly. We're the health side. There's actors who aren't are, 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 are going through health crises and they don't want to talk about it. Correct. And the show well, won't talk about it and we won't ever talk about right. it. Right. Then it's put this nebulous thing out there, what's going on and people are yeah. making stories and creating their own thing. I wanted to say back on Agnes Nixon, look at her. I mean, she remained involved with One Life to Live and All My Children, even after she was not physical, you know, like head writing the show. And so there was her touch on it always. Her there was still her touch on it. Um, right. which is what made those shows um so unbelievable, you know. One hundred percent. What do you like currently on the air on both shows? I like the Victor Cassidine story because it's going somewhere. 
It's roping in a whole lot of different people. You've got your new Luke and Laura, Spencer and Trina on the boat. Now, I didn't get to see today because I was doing a very important interview on the locker room. <laughs> but I will go watch it, <laughs> watch it when we're done. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the stowaways and now yesterday Obrecht is, you know, coming up with a way for them to be together. And she said, feed and water them. Feed and water them and take care of them. You know, now they're stowaways and they're together and they're against the world and everyone back home's fighting to find them. And it's roping and look at, you know, Felicia and Holly and Laura, Mayor Collins, the mayor's all involved and the police are all involved in WSB. And now the other day they're calling the Navy. Like, I just love it. It's, it's an umbrella story that they don't always tell. And I think it's fantastic. Well, umbrella stories are some of the best stories over every show we've watched. Of course. Are, of course. You know, I mean, you know, I just brought it up. The Doug Cummings thing was, in, you know, how many people were involved? Right. You know. um, I would say like, it's hard for me again, like there, I think we could probably can all speak to this when you start doing this on the other side, like you're, you just, there's too many other factors involved with like how you view, like you don't view it in the same way you did when mm. you were unencumbered, like that you didn't have any sort of ties. So I would say generally more as a vibe. I like that general hospital has brought back a lot of people that I care about that I started watching in the eighties. So it really like, you know, having Felicia there more, Anna, you know, uh, Holly, Robert, like Scott, like Bobby, those Lucy, those are the people I want to see. So like, I feel like you're doing that more and I'm so on board with it. Um, not to mention Laura, obviously, but, um, <laughs> and then over at YNR, I kind of, what I do appreciate YNR now in a maybe a way that I didn't years ago is that there's just a very similar, um, kind of feel to it. Like it's not crazy stories, you know, it's not like to me, Phyllis faking her death is probably the most like, you know, toe the line thing that they're like doing um, at that other shows do like with regularity. regularity. And so I just feel like the actors are, you know, <laughs> so days. Yeah. Right, <laughs> yeah days. But you know, just what I appreciate about YNR is just the interpersonal drama. Like I just feel like there are so many dramatic scenes given to these actors to work. And you care about them. Like I cared about Lily and Devon's fight. You know, I care about like that. Uh, everyone's looking at Jack, like, why are you with Diane? You know, like, why do you accept her back so quickly? And then Peter Bergman completely explained it to me of Jack's done terrible things and he's been, you know, uh, forgiven. So why wouldn't he forgive Diane? And then like, you kind of hear a very, you know, cogent, like perfect explanation. You're like, oh, okay. And then it kind of takes away the complaint you know? <laughs> because you're like, oh, okay, got it. Like done. So I guess I just appreciate that they really write for their actors to have, um, to show their strengths and yet still foster these incredible bonds between characters and families that that's what right. I'm watching soaps for. There's, it's and the it's nature of continuing drama. Fight. Like, like Victor going after Nick yesterday. Please. Yes. But like, anything like, I think Eric is, is Victor, Victor Newman. It's like the, that's the character everybody asks about. Yeah. And he's still at 81, uh, I believe is just such a vital presence on that show. Like it's hard to imagine Younger the Restless now. And to Victor. that, and to that, Eric Braden, I wanted to say when I was talking about memorable moments, I mean, the scenes with Eric Braden and George Kennedy, his father, and Dorothy McGuire, his mother, where you really get an explanation of why Victor is the way he did and how he was abandoned as a child and all of that came out. You know, Eric talks about it all the time as his favorite scenes, but that really set the tone for the backstory of Victor so we, the audience, understood why he was the way he was. And right. those scenes were amazing. Eric was amazing mm -hmm. in those scenes. Right. To your point about Sprina, I think... Uh, Having an interracial romance, young interracial romance is brilliant to be the next Luke and Laura type story on the show that has not been done. And they saw the popularity of this couple, um, this duo. And, you know, every time I post something, I'm sure you do, it's like Sabrina brands go crazy. They've got a built in core audience now. Um, so I think it's great to use them in this story with Victor and how they, they're playing this out. And to Stephanie's point also, I love that the vets are being used. How great. When I see a scene between Robert and Holly, like the time she left before this time and they snuck her out and they had that kiss between Robert and Holly before they left. It was so touching. You know, yeah. you're, 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 well, you're like, that's what I want to see. That's what I want to see. And so they're giving it to us in bits and pieces on well, general. Like, right like a good soap opera, kind of parceling it out. Right. But I think that's the payoff of being a longtime viewer is that when these people come back, you are given moments that 
they know like that you do like, want to oh, see. It would feel yeah. unsatisfied if I hadn't seen a Robert Holly scene, you know? Right. It's kind of like what everyone was saying about maybe more Nina and Abby, that there wasn't more of, you know, on Young and Restless, that there wasn't more of like a real, like huge clash between, or that, or that she hadn't seen Chance. Like they're just, those moments to me are yeah. the kind that stick out, like something that should happen you that maybe hasn't had missed opportunities. Yeah. Perfect word. Yes. And to your point yeah. on what I think is good and why in our, I mean, I, I'm so glad Michelle Stafford has a story. Uh, like a, oh, a, yeah. a, a big mean, story. I mean, she's been puddling, you know, they've had the character kind of puddling around and now it's like, okay, we're giving her this. And the fans on my site, they're all about it. They're well, all- Her performances like, have been insane. so unbelievable. unbelievable. And it's like- and she's one of the few actors who let herself look bad on camera. You know, look like a hag. She had that horrible, you know, well, well I suppose when you murder someone, you do get a little disheveled. A little haggy. Um, <laughs> You know, when she murdered uh, Stark the other day, but like her hair is all like, you know, horrible and not combed and she doesn't seem to have makeup on and like she's willing. And that's, you know, it draws me to that character. No, she's been exceptional in this and I'm so glad they're giving her the ball. And that's what's making me watch YNR right now. Like what's going to happen with Phyllis mm -hmm. and this whole Diane story and Stark and who was really in the drag the body out? Is it really his? Yeah, true. Yeah. And they've set up the dynamic now with Kyle fighting with Billy Abbott, which I really like. Like, they give me some juice at Newman and Abbott. Give me some yep. people fighting. Don't mind us, Alan. We're just talking. I'm loving it. I'm don't, loving it. Like, don't but, you know, I was going back to Stephanie. Going and... like, oh, the quarterly numbers are in. I don't care. Show me people fighting. Show me, like, I'm going to go up today. I'm going to go fight, talk to Jack. Okay, you like go. cat fights, you guys? Say again? Over them. Do you like? I don't love a cat fight. I don't. I don't fight with women. Oh, I, I love just... cat fight. <laughs> oh, on on a soap, a good cat fight is. I mean, people going I, not necessarily wrong. You know, I don't. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to go at each other, go that's very it. different. I feel like physical to me. Like when when women push each other around, I and just today, it doesn't I don't feel right. organic. As a woman, what you think of these cat fights? Because people have been on. You know. More people have liked them less and less. Carolyn doesn't agree. I can see it on her. Well, face. I just can say for me, and obviously the only way to kind of present your opinion is how it affects you personally. I have literally, other than my sister, have never put my hands on another woman. Like, so no matter how many fights I've had with someone, and that was as a child, um, you know, I've never pushed someone. I've never. So to me, like arguing words to, is very dramatic, but once you're getting physical, I kind of am just like, mm, you well, had me a lot. How many times did you come back from the dead? How many times have you had amnesia? <laughs> it's the end. I find them very entertaining. Like when, when Susan Flanner used to go and went in the pool, cool. you know, when Darling Conley went in the pool. Sorry, we're on B&B &B now. Um, but like whenever someone's thrown in a pool, it gives me Alexis Crystal vibes from Dynasty. And I think it's fantastic. And even just snarky talk is great, but I'm fine with, you know, Lucy busting through at the nurse's ball the other day. Yeah, and me too. I would have been fine if she would have gone. Oh, about I love it. Lucy busting through the thing. That was so brilliant. Cause I was like, how are they going to work this in for her to end up either with her clothes off or, you know, showing up. I and thought if Bobby had clocked her for ruining her moment, I would have been fine with that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I just want to say that Carolyn, this is the very nature of our emails. We're like, she'll email me something, and I'll email her back, and it's like, shocker, we don't agree. So the, the so. subject matters, things I can't say in my opinion column, things yeah. I well, can't tweet. Carolyn, how do you decide what goes in your opinion? You know, it's only my opinion. Do you and Steph just, you know, talk about it, or did you and Lynn back in the, you know, is it all your thoughts? Seventy one answer that? No, it is. <laughs> Let's just say this. We do stop <laughs> short of you cannot insult an actor. You could not get too hard about a storyline because I feel like Michael did say that, you know, it, it is somewhat of a thankless job to be a head writer, especially in today's age where oh, the, yeah. the feedback is immediate. Yeah. So I feel like it's very easy to armchair quarterback and be like, I would do this. I would do that. But at the same time, they're turning out a lot of material. And I think there's something really unfair about, criticize like constant criticism of them because hey yeah, that like I, it's a, this is the nature of the beast like some stories yeah. are gonna be great some are not well when I, was, and, and what I always say people do not set out to tell a bad story that's a they very good point yeah. there, yeah. and I will say it they are working their ass off like yeah. I would not want it could not do it to write head write or even a you know it, it is really it is a Daunting. hard job that they have. Yeah. And when Lynn, I, I am, when that, Lynn, that makes 
asked me to write the column back in the 90s, I mean, it was obvious that it was going to be positive and negative. So for, and really every show has positive and negative. So yeah. um, like a few weeks ago I wrote, I, and I always say to Steph, can I say this, knowing that she's going to say no, but ahead of time I asked just because it's funny. <laughs> there was an actress on YNR who had an extremely low cut dress on and at the, at the party. And she said, what have I forgotten? And I said to Stephanie, a bra. <laughs> and I'm like, can I say that? Now it would have been funny. I'm not making fun of the actress that they dressed her like right. that. But he's like, no, you can't say that. Well, because you're ultimately like, you're making fun of the wardrobe department. So someone will be upset by it. And it's right. just, I think Carolyn's column in it, you know, what's so great about it is that you are echoing thoughts that the audience had. And, and I so love the shows. I love them. She, right. So I just feel like there's a nice balance where someone they isn't always, gonna read always, it and really they always say to be in on the joke, you know, you're mm -hmm. in on it. Then what you do is make it feel like we're all in on it. You know right. what I mean? That instead of poking fun at it, it's we're all in on it. Right. And that's what they always used to say to me at the end. Like, well, you can't do that. You have to make sure it's everybody's, you know. So I had to like toe that line all the time. I would die to do Carolyn's column sometimes and have that voice that she has. But I'm always the good guy playing neutral. You know, I would yeah. love to be like, blah, 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 blah. You know, so I to I, there's a lot I want to touch before we have to go. So okay. uh, on that note, Carolyn, for you, I would assume you probably hear the most, I would think. But to all of you um, from these two shows, let's stick to not in general. Um, you know, somebody responding to one of your columns or something you wrote, Michael or Stephanie, you wrote about Young and the Restless or General Hospital. Has anyone you know, come back at you, taking you to task for what you wrote or or any of your opinions in, in, in the story. I used to have the sidebar of it's only my opinion was it's only your opinion. And the meaner letter to me was the better. It got in. I would I'd go, oh my God, this is great. They hate me. And I would, you know, how dare you say this about coal? You know, I didn't like coal on YNR. And I'm like, oh, you like coal. Great. Here's a, you know, everyone has an opinion. I just happen to be lucky enough to have space in the magazine for 30 years to give mine. Um, but no, the meaner, the better I would put it in. And, and it's funny now on Twitter, you know, people will write like you were wrong about this. And I'm like, thank you for reading the column. You, you make a great point. Like, right. I'm just one person. I forward them to Carolyn. Those are really the ones. Cause she really is the only, like we do do thumbs up and thumbs down. So I will right. occasionally, and it's really not that often get a letter of like, I didn't agree with your, you know, thumbs down on whatever. I, I, I can't think of like a very specific one right now. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it is responding to Carolyn's column and I forward them to her. <laughs> And I love it when I see a sound off letter that's like, how dare Carolyn Hinsey say that? I'm like, yeah. And that's why I print them because I do the sound off column and I know that Carolyn will appreciate like an, an I didn't agree with you shout out. Like, yeah. How can I have this column and not respect other people's opinions? Right. Well, it's like the four of us going to a movie. We're all going to have a different right. view. You know, it right. really is. Right. Any other, Michael, anything stick out well, in your mind? mind? It's not specific to story. It's more about like, why are you not writing about that and covering that and that happened? Oh, What's yeah. your problem? Or <laughs> um, I'm stupid because <laughs> I had the fact wrong or they think I uh, have the fact wrong. You know, it's more historical things with YNR and GH if there's something or why am I not doing an interview with this one? And to everybody's point here that does interviews, let's talk about this. Yeah. You know, they don't understand. I may have asked for that interview. They may right. not be letting us do interviews with them or it may be going to Digest or it may be going to people or it may be going to this or who knows. Um, or the actor doesn't want or the to actor, press. The actor, or, right. or, or the actor hasn't even responded to anybody. Yeah. Like, that's well, a key so, point. If the actor doesn't like the story, they don't want to do press about it. it. Yeah. Right. So there's a lot they're of They're not going to say the story's stupid. I don't like it. And they have to plug the story, but they don't like the story. They'll just say, I'm not doing press on this particular story because I don't like it. I'm going to play it the best I can, but I don't want to talk about it because it's disingenuous. And right. We but can I never say that. Right. And what I get a lot is, well, you did an interview with them on your YouTube channel. Why don't you do that? And they're, uh, and I'm like, how do you know that I haven't asked for them? And I don't want to go through the whole process of experience. Correct. I, I get that, Michael, all the time and the mistakes, because, you know, that's why I have you here to talk about <laughs> theater my art. I am not, you know, I watched two shows and did PR on those two shows. I did not watch the entire industry. I did watch a little more, of, you know, Capital Young the Restless because my mom was a CBS person, mm -hmm. but I am no expert. And I have never claimed, you know, 
to be. You know, we all make mistakes. You know, we're not set, you know, just like the head writers or the writers, nobody's setting out to tell a bad story. Nobody's setting out right. to make an error in well, their reporting of. But I also think there's some things where it, they're not necessarily correct either. <laughs> you know, they're telling us. Oh, about, for sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 Where we were I don't of- think the fans appreciate how much money it costs. Like if you do a party, every extra gets paid and it's all union money. Every extra is paid, let's say 500 bucks. Any person with more than five lines is paid, you know, 1100 bucks. So is it really worth it to have 20 people milling around in the background that's going to cost you 20 grand out of your budget? No. Right. But again, as I said about sort of how actors are paid, I feel like finances is something that is just not really discussed. So if it's sort of this big question mark and they don't really know, you know, I think even we don't know completely all the time what the story is. So I just feel like right. or there what's is going down for them. Well, and to Stephanie's point, it's like, we don't go, I don't go there, right? You're right. Not, we're not going to go there because then it opens the whole thing. And we don't even know the intricacies of the whole thing. We think we do. But I will say when Alan was the As the World Turns publicist, oh, it was literally the hardest show to get actors to speak about. So like hard. you had a yeah. whole list of people who would you not do that. Right? You, you know, people ask for this show, you know, can you get, and- that show in some respects for somebody who was the PR person was the hardest to get people to, to just do, you know? So it was literally know. the hardest show yeah, I say of yeah. all the years. Oh. And you are correct. I am going on 33 that I would sit there like, okay, we could get Deidre Hall, Drake Hogeston, Peter Reckle and Christian Alfonso like that. But like there's five people on with all due respect, a much lower rated show <laughs> who like, no, nope, not even interested in promoting it. I was That's like, great. okay. And I would call you, Alan, or, and I would be like, and you'd be like, yeah, well, they're not going to, you know, <laughs> yeah. why not? And they'd be like, it was what? tough. It was tough. Some, you know, but then, you know, Larry did my Catherine Hayes tribute. And that's great. Right. You know, right. he never oh, spoke to anybody. Larry Brigman. Oh. He never <laughs> spoke to anybody. He didn't talk to anybody. Yeah, it's been a story for years and it's like you can't even ask yeah so yeah yeah it, it's fabulous um look you know there's two other shows on the air what did you think when days got that two-year renewal i was very excited i exactly. mean i feel like everyone had something to say about the peacock move as though it was negative rather than looking at it as Here's a show that we feel we can pull off the network to tentpole, you know, like a, a day part on a new streaming service. Everyone was like, that means it's going off the air. No, no, it doesn't at all. It's the exact opposite. Right. So I think I appreciated that they said that it was in the top 10 of all like, you know, viewed shows on Peacock. Yeah. I mean, but Beyond Salem had to have given them some glimmer that, you know, this would be a successful show. So I feel like it's good news all around. I do too. And I think that, you know, Peacock really has got a tentpole with Days of Our Lives. I and mean, they're loyal viewers that watch that show. They're going to come right. in no matter what. And haven't we always seen this with All My Children and One Life to Live and them coming online, which I worked for that, for the Prospect Park during that time and seen all the debacle and then moving a show from network to online to streaming like now. But that was and, 10 years ago. I know. I'm just saying it was naysayers. And I'm just saying the fans sometimes have to move with the show. You know, there's a lot of, they feel roadblocks for them. Right. And, and it's different. Well, but G- we all have to move. You know? GH on Hulu is fantastic with no ads. And yesterday they interrupted part of it. And I'm like, I don't care. I'll watch it at eight o'clock on Hulu. Like, I mean, I still flip out when they interrupt. Like they interrupted GH yesterday for Alec Baldwin's what? Um, he's, he's he's not getting. Uh, I know. That, that, they interrupted for that. They interrupted GH for like ten minutes yesterday in New York, for for that. I mean, I'm sorry, it's not breaking news. It's it's an important story for the Baldwin family, but right. You know, we lost wow. all kinds of like Laura and Steve Steve Steve. doing this, and we missed it. But right. I got to watch it on Hulu last night. So right, but well, that's where yeah. they, you know, you know, it's more important to the network from a network perspective. We'll interrupt right. the show. Let's say show. this: right. news will always trump soaps. Period. One hundred percent. But I do want to make a point about Peacock in terms of moving with the times, and not to like contradict you, Michael. But I do feel like. It's something that I feel for people maybe of of what they of a certain age or they're maybe used to watching yeah. it in a certain way. When no. you have fifty, I'm not saying just well, let me finish. <laughs> when you have fifty years of free programming to then suddenly have to pay for it, you know, or like fifty five plus years of free programming, yeah. you know, there is a little like, wait, I don't get it. At the same time, uh, if I wanted to watch the Yankee game tonight, 
it is on Amazon Prime. If I, you know, during the season, football also does the same thing. So it's not as though there aren't other parts of television that are becoming pay only. So I feel like Days is sort of a little bit ahead of that curve right now. But I do get the complaints of the people who don't want to pay that money. Oh, no, so want- they should take advantage of those sale of like the specials that they and, do because I to think- me, nineteen ninety nine a year is awesome. I think if we all could pay right now for all my children, one life to live as the world turns and guiding light, we would be spending the money. I would. I understand, but to clarify, Stephanie, I agree with you. I <laughs> understand. I just want to clarify. I do understand the fans, um, the quandary. I do understand them being upset to have to pay for it when they've been getting it free. I really did. And when I first saw this, I thought this is going to be a problem. Um, and it can still, still continue to be. You have to look for deals, right? Sign up deals, I guess, apparently. Right. Uh, but I do get it. But unfortunately, I think the whole world is moving right. away. And we don't even know how long all these shows may be really on. All right, well, know. let's be positive here. Also, you know, you can read the magazine to keep up to date with anything you might be missing. <laughs> that's definitely a bonus. <gasps> Look at that. Oh, wait. Look at that. Uh, and this one. This is page 50. This is what so, I do. So quickly, if you have the power to bring one back right now, which one would it be, Stephanie? One life to live. Oh my gosh! No, go to me last. I, 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 I the first one I actually thought was another world. That's the one, one that popped up live. first. One life to live. Interesting. Okay, I would take another world back. That's that's awesome. Oh. What are you liking on Bold and the Beautiful? Um, I actually I am loving the whole story with. Sheila, I I know that people complain it's been on too much. I don't disagree with that. I think that show at at times could have a bit of a balance issue, but I feel like when you have only 18 minutes to tell, there's only so many stories you can tell. So I feel like just the tentacles of that story and just roping and bridge and roping and bill, like finally Don Dion is working. You know, I, I just, I've appreciated what Brad Bell has done there. And I think that there has just been like one surprise in a legitimate way after another in those stories. Yes. And that's what I was going to say. The legitimate surprises in the stories that Brad Bell has continued to pull off mm-hmm. has made that show for 19 minutes of airtime you can literally you do want to watch it like i want to make sure i don't miss the surprise like right yeah the same things play out um there is a big surprise here and there and to your point i was talking to kimberlyn the other day and brad bell up the 9,000th episode celebration and it was like how do you guys keep this going do you literally have to sit there and go how do we keep sheila in the show because she's done so many awful things but they continually find ways which speaks to Kimberlyn and to Don Diamond. I thought it was great that he got that story. Mm-hmm. I was only hoping that wasn't going to be the twist. Right, right, right. I was hoping it'd be something was wrong with his brain or something. <laughs> oh, I like the twist. I love the bromance of him and Ridge. Me too. That line, that line of Ridge's, I put it in my opinion column. He looks like a, a pirate that got dressed in a mall. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you, I will take dialogue like that every day, you know. B and B has some amazing classic lines. Like yeah. those are really uh, funny yeah. scripts. And and the great tags with the yes, first, like Steffi's yeah. face when Sheila's doing something awful, they pull in on her. Just like, you know, there's yeah. like great great tags. Tags are the best. I mean, I wish you know if if all the shows were still on or you you know you had enough of Egg good fest. quality good quality YouTube videos that somebody could create gifs with all those tags. I know. Absolutely. Well, or at least I wish that they had gotten the music rights back in the day so we could start screen. You know, that's another thing. The fans, I mean, you would pay. I'd pay to watch GH from the beginning, but they only I'd pay to watch every years. show from the beginning. It, it's it's Eight really years. a shame. It's yeah. really a shame. I mean, people ask me every day about World Turns and Guiding Light. Every day. So many I'd people, watch it all over again. Sorry. And so many people in the industry when they're doing segments ask me, do you know how I can get into Procter and Gamble? They don't have their archives or their or their Yeah, I, I know. Uh, uh, a, a news crew up in Connecticut was looking for footage of Liz, unfortunately. And I tried and then you know, we don't have it, sadly. And speaking of losing Elizabeth Hubbard, share a favorite scene, memory of Liz that comes to mind before we go? Well, Stephanie, the Lily fan should go first. Well, it's, it's actually <laughs> funny because the only, like the thing that I think about first and Carolyn, you and I've done this for years. So I just feel like there was a roundup in digest, like an editor's roundup in digest where I don't know if it was, what was your favorite thing all year? Who's your favorite character? Can you say it together. 
Lucinda, Lucinda kills me with, with her one-liners. Sorry, it was slays. Lucinda slays me with her one-liners. And that was Carolyn's answer to it. And like to me, that encapsulated like everything that Liz did in, in just that one sentence. It's like everything she did was so watchable. Like you just could not look away when Lucinda was on camera. So I loved everything she did. But I, I as I've been thinking about this, like I, I can't say like a specific scene stands out for me because Lisa she's Brown, so when it she, was revealed that Lisa Brown Ivy was her mother. Yeah. Was, Mar was Lily's mother. Um she's just so tied into all of my like Snyder family memories me, me and too, my Lily me memories. Too. So it's hard to like kind of put one specific one out. You know. Yeah, and whoever and she went to, to burn for you know keeping her out there and bringing her Emmys and yep. putting her on shows like Martha really was like no 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 you're not retiring, I mean she was 89 Alan right I know yeah yeah I mean she was at the Emmys in 2015 or 16 no 2018 was it was because because that's the last time I saw her Mara and I Leminski and I saw Martha and Liz like outside of the Emmys and but I she's said I can't believe that was five years ago the Emmys. I mean that's amazing yeah. He was amazing, truly one of the all-time greatest, really. And I'll tell you how great. So all of those Emmy nominations she had for As the World Turns, and I would be doing the nominee packages for them where I'd have to take the reel and figure out what 10, 15-second nugget of Elizabeth Hubbard to put in it. And they, you know, to your point, she can read the phone book and make it interesting. She can do anything. So I pick these scenes and I go to the producers and they go, who's this? And I go, this is Elizabeth Hubbard. She's a, you know, and they were like all blown away. These are guys that have no idea what a soap opera is. They don't know one, but when she was on in the scenes I showed them, they were like, oh, she's, well, she's going to be the winner. Sadly, she did not win for As the World Turns. But, which is really a which is shocking. Yeah. Um, but I loved her from Dr. Althea Davis on The Doctors. I mean, I loved Althea Davis on The Doctors. And in our interviews we shared together, the one I think I posted about, how her mother was a doctor in real life mm -hmm. and everything. And when I talked to her at the daytime Emmys or when I was on the Emmys and she sang, I mean, she was such a bigger than life character in, and just such a fantastic actress and Martha and hers camaraderie through the years is so touching. Um, and it, then to bring it full circle, Alec Baldwin did tweet about Alec her because they worked together yeah, on the I doctor. know, I thought so, that was beautiful. Yes. Yeah, yes. I did too. I appreciate yeah. that. I appreciate anyone who leaves soaps right. and still talks about it. And still it. talks oh, about it. Yeah. Remember. Julianne did it after Julianne Moore. I mean, I just and, talked about that with somebody, yeah, how incredible yeah. it was that she came uh -huh. back at the end. Ray yeah. Liotta was well, always and, so great. And that she also tributed uh, on Instagram to Kathy Hayes after she passed. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that, it just... Way to it, bring it around, Stephanie. Way to bring it around. <laughs> That's why I'm here. You're an editor. <laughs> this has been amazing. Thank you all so much. It's so good to see your faces and, and just have fun. This Same. Is great. Same. Thank you, Alan. I'm glad we're not calling you anymore going like... Is it true that so and so uh -huh. got drunk at a bar? And yeah, I, I've got to call and get guests now and get interviews. Right now, you know what it was <laughs> like all those right years. Now, it's a very, very different world. It's, and yeah. the first agreeing to talk to you when so many of your actors wouldn't agree to talk to <laughs> us, <laughs> and your actors wouldn't talk to us. <laughs> yeah, well, they're not. They're not busy now. <laughs> you know, they're, yeah. a lot of them are. You know, yeah. Yeah, it's a but shame. I appreciate that. And Alan, thank you for doing this because it's been three years of just these incredible interviews and people thank that you. you have, you know, brought back for us to like share those stories and experiences with all over again. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And that's what I was going to say, because you brought up about, you know, like General Hospital bringing people back. You know, I, I think I'm still doing this because everybody, we were all disconnected for those two and a half years. And seeing those faces for not just the fans for all of us really you know it meant a lot it, it meant really a lot. did it, you know it went, was comforting when, yes yes Brought it warmed my cold heart alan actually it should be my <laughs> cold heart what do you mean <laughs> like, cold alan, you don't have as cold a heart as if you're if you're shedding tears stephanie now i'm now i'm wondering <laughs> this is her response every time nope not here I think we need to put the two of you in front of us and see bad scenes and see if any of you lose it. Yeah, and right. Michael, like, you and I will pick. Michael, you and I pick we'll the pick scene. The scene. <laughs> and play it. You just sit there. That is the next edition of the locker room. Yeah, I love okay. that. Making Not Stephanie cry. Tune in next week. Or you. Or you. <laughs> or me.
Yeah, have a great friend. weekend. Thanks, Mike. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Michael. So thanks, Alan. Thanks, Kiki. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Till the next Kiki. Oh my God, that was fabulous. Thank you, Carolyn Hinsey, Michael Fairman, and Stephanie Sloan for sharing your memories and spending this hour with me. And thank you to Susan Eisenberg for coming up with this great idea. Michael Fameron's latest single, Back to Myself, is out now and available on all major music streaming platforms, including Spotify and Apple Music. Please do me a favor and join me for my first Conversations with Alan episode on my new Conversations with Alan channel next Wednesday, April 26th at 7 p.m. Eastern. It would mean the world if you would subscribe to that channel. Join me next. Uh, joining me for that episode is Matthew E. Berger, who is the executive director of the Foundation to Combat Anti-Semitism, where he is leading the foundation's launch of the Stand Up to Jewish Hate campaign. Next Friday, April 28th, Roger Newcomb and Damon Jacobs, who you all know from We Love Soaps, will join me live to talk about the 13th annual Indie Series Awards. I hope you all have a great weekend. I will see you next week. And as always, please stay safe.